Welcome to As Real As They Come Dallas. We are back. 2021 is here and uh, so are we. So please don't forget to hit subscribe, like, share, please comment and let us know what we can do better. Or if you'd like to be on the show, please reach out. We'll be more than happy to have you. So today, one of my wonderful guests is a phenomenal book writer. And uh, well. Carl? Tell us about yourself and introduce yourself. Let's start with something very specific, right? <laughs> so, um, it, you know, people have asked me, when did I actually begin writing? I, I started writing when I was a young boy. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did is because of my grandmother's influence. I spent many, um, many a day in the summertime and often after school uh, spending time with her. And she's a great storyteller. She was, um, in fact, a phenomenal storyteller with a rich history in her, in her family. Um, she had immigrated from France to Canada to eventually my uh, home state of Michigan. And so yeah, I, it just came naturally to me to pick up a pen and start writing. And, you know, by the time I was in the fifth and sixth grade, I was writing stories. They weren't very good, but they were stories. And, um, what I was doing the whole time, I realize now, was just collecting um, characterizations of people and interesting facts about how people how people live, how they exist, how they how they interact, from all my grandmother's stories. So she would bring out the baked breads and the cookies, and she'd have her trove of all these photographs from from the old country, and start showing them to me and telling me what each specific. Uh, photograph meant to her as well as the individuals in those photographs who they were and she had a mind that was able to recall things from her early childhood I think I may have in inherited that same brain because that, that was also true of me so she was my first and by far my biggest influence growing up Wow and yeah. where was she from well this is in the uh, a place called I'll do this for the camera <laughs> the thumb area of Michigan, okay? So Michigan has this peculiar peninsula that juts out into Lake Huron, and I was from way over near the edge of the lake oh, in wow. Lake Huron. So yeah, we had some brilliant sunrises. The west side of the state got to brag about sunsets, but trust me, the, the sunrises were also brilliant. So that's where I grew up, uh, and it was a very much a farming and fishing community. Um, a lot of people um, owned very expensive cabins up in that area where I grew up and so um, also had a chance to see a lot of those people uh, how they lived their lives how, as well as how they interacted with people like my father he was a home builder and so I, when I think back on it now I realize that I've been in one way or another collecting stories my whole life okay wow so yeah and um, Heather how did you guys meet well, we uh, sang in choir together at our church, and on one fateful summer day, right before we broke from our uh, choir practice for the summer, I looked at Carl, we sat next to each other, and I said, so, what you doing this summer? Little did I know that the answer would then launch a, a many-year project. Yeah. So he showed up uh, the next day, or maybe a couple of days later with this, he calls it the doorstop. Right. a manuscript for a full-length novel that he has written and it has yet to be published uh, but that is part of why the Butchers of Prague has happened is I'm working as his publicist and a bunch of other things uh, kind of a Jackie of all trades and um, I encouraged him to take some of his wonderful ideas and to go ahead and build his uh, reader audience before he launches into the big books because they're right. phenomenal Wow and uh you kind of led us to the cherry on top of our conversation. This is what <laughs> the reason how we met, how we Indeed. started our conversation, the Butchers of Frog. Right. I got very intrigued by, first of all, it was a book signing event. That's right. And, at a little um, coffee shop, yeah. At a little coffee shop, one of our favorite coffee yeah. shops, Do You Know Coffee? And I've got my signature, so... At the end of this uh, podcast, please feel free to reach out to Carl, and he'll be more than happy to sign one of his books for you. Emphasis on please. <laughs> okay, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yes. 
So how did you come about to write this uh, manuscript? <laughs> well, the manuscript, the manuscript uh, more or less wrote itself in my head for the better part of two years. Um, what happened was um, a three-day detour uh, to the Christmas markets of Prague turned into a 10-day um, quest for survival. Okay? And uh, as my wife and I were finally boarding a plane bound for the States um, two days before Christmas, uh, I looked over at her with tears in her eyes and I said, who would ever believe what just happened? And she burst into laughter and she said, absolutely no one. No one will ever believe what we've just experienced. Wow. So I knew in that moment I had to write the story and I sat there with my single malt scotch next to me as I started jotting down events and I woke up seven and a half hours later no further than when I had begun but I knew <laughs> I had this idea building and it just needed the right time to percolate because that's pretty much how I write my stories. I very much subscribe to uh, another famous actor, uh, I'm sorry, a famous writer um, but most of my stories are built from inside my head and it takes me a while to just put all of those pieces together. In this case, uh, the natural timing brought us to the season of COVID last year. And uh, as Hemingway himself said, um, in answer to the question, where do you go to write your stories? Uh, he said, well, in my head, that's where I go. So by last springtime, when people are all in lockdown, it just seemed like the natural time to come out with a story that could very easily have turned dark. So I decided to turn it into a dark comedy and let it grow from there into something that just had broader appeal because, in fact, that's what my wife and I experienced in that moment on the plane was, this is comedic and yet it could have easily turned horror. So, so with that in mind, uh, I, I set about writing this and started sending chapters to Heather um, as I could. and. Before long, we were having full-blown conversations about what this might turn into. Wow, that's so, yeah. incredible. So what would be the best way for you to describe if you had about three to five words to describe your story? <laughs> no, no pushing you to. <laughs> um, yeah, that is a deer in the headlights question. Uh, so let me approach it this way. Um, it's a uh, macabre tale about survival, but I'm going to shorten it from there. This is really a case of, um, uh, give me an example of any, any author that you consider to be a, a good espionage slash mystery writer, mm -hmm. okay? And it's that person meets Dr. Frankenstein. Oh, wow. Okay? So that's what this is. Uh, take Tom Clancy, for example. Okay? He, he's a well-known figure to many uh, readers. I would say Tom Clancy meets Dr. Frankenstein. That's exactly what this is. Wow. So is that short enough? That's phenomenal. That's <laughs> <laughs> I had to talk around in circles before I could come up with that. But, uh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's that's absolutely perfect. That's actually a great perfect. question. Yeah. And... Uh, to our viewers, why would you recommend this book? Um, first of all, because, um, wow, well, um, okay, let me choose my words carefully here. <laughs> so, um, bad things happen to good people all the time, we know this. Um, sometimes they happen in a foreign country under circumstances that you not only can't control, but you suddenly find yourself in dire straits, and um, how are you going to get out of it? And so this is the question I'd pose to potential readers of this story. Imagine yourself in the case of the protagonists, there are two, and how do they manage to escape? Um, the reasons for needing to escape become evident, obvious, quickly enough, right up front in the story because it is written in the genre of mystery suspense. So uh, I would say, uh, because it's a fast read, uh, it was written to be a fast read and to be fun. Um, it, you know, you, you are gonna find many 
twists and turns that you didn't expect, many of which actually happened, okay, to me. And I wear the scars to prove it. So, all right, so that's my first day. I don't know, what are your, what are your thoughts about that? And I think that the, the best way that you've described it to many people is to say it's a fun romp. Yeah. It's just a, it's, it's a read that once you start it, you don't want to put it down. So don't start it at 1 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Though it will go quickly because it's engaging. Um, me, most of my family has read it and their reactions were, you know, watching them consume it. You know, as I have several boys and watching them consume it, stay up all night, whatever. Just, this should be a movie. That was great. That, that's, that's not the kind of book I would normally read, but I literally couldn't put it down. So. And it, right. And in that same vein, we have gotten, I've gotten a lot of response so far from the readers that have digested it quickly like that late at night, who have written back to me and said, you owe me a night of sleep, okay? <laughs> I picked this thing up at 10, at 10 o'clock at night and I couldn't put it down until I was done. So you owe me a night of sleep. <laughs> well, and I thought that as, as an editor, you know, that this is my first real adventure in editing, um, that I would get tired of rereading it. And I don't know how many times I read this book, and I never got tired of it. So, you know, 20, 30. I even read it out loud to one of our editors, um, uh, a man named Hal, who, who really pitched in at the end and, and gave us an invaluable um, perspective. Yeah, he turned out to be a real precious find for us. Hal is a guy with a, a very rich background in two fields. He was a former cop and detective turned English professor. Wow. So once you read a little bit of this story, you're going to understand why that places a certain amount of pressure on an author to make sure details are right. And Hal was invaluable. He gave really good feedback, and uh, I think you know it, it helped to make the story um, just sing, just just be much more pointed and uh, and true. So it's not one of those stories where you're like, oh, that will never happen in the real life. Oh, you're going to say that plenty of times. From the whole perspective. I promise you, you'll say that more than once when you read the story. Know that it really happened. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I, can, I cannot wait to read that. <laughs> so you mentioned your grandmother is one of your main influencers. What a couple other people that you can mention that played a huge part in your creative life and in your writing career? Well, there were two people in education that uh, really were the touchstone for me figuring out that writing was something one way or another I had to do the rest of my life. And, and the first of those was a middle school English composition teacher, okay? Um, the other was a uh, professor of mine in college, Mrs. Elliott. If you should ever watch this, thank you, okay? You didn't give up on me. Uh, she was my middle school English comp teacher, and uh, I remember many of the lessons you taught, okay? Uh, so I'm interested in your feedback once you read this. Yeah, she actually bought it, so a shout out to her. The other is a, uh, uh, a gentleman who was uh, half Cherokee. He was an English professor. He was my professor in undergrad as well as in my graduate school studies in, in creative writing. His name was Carol Arnett, um, but he had a Cherokee name as he was half Cherokee. His Cherokee name was given him by his particular tribe of the Cherokee Nation. The name was Gogiski, and Gogiski is Cherokee for smoke. And so um, that uh, is an influence on my life that influenced me both as a poet and later as a, as a writer of these stories. Because wow. poetry is also a, a, a big part of my past. Cherokee, that's exquisite. I'm always fascinated by Native American culture. Yeah. And I just, I read some books back in the day about yeah. uh, how things were unfolding. And to me, it's just never really met anyone specific from Native American culture. Like, and specific meaning my videographer Walt, he is part Cherokee, but meaning my biggest dream is to meet maybe a real shaman or yeah. someone that right. lives and breathes that phenomenal, almost lost culture right. and just learn more about it. To me, it's just been always something a, special. Yeah. Carol was the chief of his particular tribe and he lived 
and walked the talk. He, re he really did. Um, and, and I uh, learned so much from him in a relatively short number of years. Um, we stayed in touch for many years thereafter. We eventually lost touch um, due to one reason or another. I was traveling with my family and uh, his life had changed, but he was um, a profound influence on my poetry as well as the, the sense of um, rhythm that still accompanies anything I write. Um, I always try to run it through the filter of what would Gugiski say. So, all right. Yeah. Wow. So you are really blessed with the people that I was very blessed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can't say enough about what those two people uh, did for me, the gift they gave me. So what's a common myth about what you do, about your career? <laughs> <laughs> uh, wealth, fame, and fortune, first of all. Wow. Yeah. This is just enormous, right? Not really. <laughs> okay. You should see those paparazzi we were <laughs> Now, so uh, a common myth, I think, is is uh, centers around. I'm going to focus on two. The first is that in order to um, ever become anything of a writer, amount to anything as a writer, you must find an agent. You must become published by one of the big five publishing houses or one of the other more established publishing houses in the U.S. today. Um, there, there is a certain amount of truth to, the, to that element of the story. Um, if you're fortunate enough to fit a particular demographic and profile, you are going to be in higher demand than if you don't fit that demographic. However, um, there is a... Um, there's another myth, and that is that um, writing and becoming published um, instantly means some form of wealth. Anything but. That is not the case at all. And particularly if you choose the path of self-publishing or establishing, as in this case, a publishing house yourself. Um, and so those are two myths that, you know, that the lifeblood of any author is his or her readers. I mean, this readership that you're after. Um, and the more readers, the better. Because, in my humble opinion, you also learn from the feedback you get from your readers. What works, what doesn't work, all right? Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an iterative process. And I am still in the infancy of my path, on my journey down this path, okay? So for me, starting late in life, I am a late bloomer, um, and there are reasons behind that. But there's also a rich history to my writing that goes back many years um, in my life and my experiences. So, so it's better late than never. It's better late than never. <laughs> it's better late than never. I couldn't I'm... have said it better. <laughs> but what is late? Who's there right. to say what's late? That's right. Would you read a book of a 20-year-old that has no experience, that never paved its own road? Or there could be a 20-year-old that's got probably War and Peace novel full of experience. You never right. know. That's it's right. It's all the experience that you share with Indeed. other people. And, and yeah, as St. Augustine himself said, uh, the world is a book. And if you never leave your home or your hometown, you haven't turned the first page. And I couldn't agree more. Um, but I also think the flip side of that is true, that some people, um, because of circumstance, have the opportunity to travel more than do others. And those are people who have an obligation to give back, who have the opportunity to enrich others' lives by telling them stories, by helping them understand other cultures. And that's equally a responsibility that any good writer who uh, lives any amount of years on this earth and travels, they need to do. And so that's part of my mission, is to share those stories. Wow, that's that's very deep. And I think that's serious because in my... Is that too deep? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Because the thing is, that in, in my book of life, the true definition of success is when you are confident and available to share your experience 
because somebody needs exactly the words that you are out there putting out into the right. universe and there is always going to be someone at least one person that will hear it and it might help them it might put them to the next absolutely. level in their life yeah. and that's a big deal absolutely it, it inspires them to some form of action and that presumably enriches their lives and the lives of others. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's it. That makes me think of how this whole thing actually started. The bookstop, the doorstop yeah. that he brought yes. over um, <laughs> is not this. No. It's an entirely oh. different novel. And when I looked at it, I was merely saying, I love to read and I have, a, you know, an art and graphic design background and I can find, I can find typos. Oh, well, that's what I can do. I picked up this book and it was life changing. You know, you're talking about people having the right words and the people need to hear these words. His first book uh, of this set is um, a psychological healing. It's this this incredible journey that will touch countless people. And there is a bookend to it. There's another the book back. that is the spiritual journey, which will again make enormous difference. And so I made a commitment. Um, early on in this and said these books have to get published I'm I'm in all in I will do whatever it takes so that these will get into people's hands so in encouraging him to do um, the butchers of Prague it was so that more people will have the blessing of seeing these two books when they come out because um, absolutely astonishing what sorts of change they promote. Don't don't let her fool you. Uh, she's quite capable of killing my fondest darlings, okay? <laughs> and and that, that's a term that means something in the in the world of writers, right? You may be familiar with this, <laughs> Yulia, but basically it, it refers to uh, you know elements or characters of a book, of a story that sort of represent your vein side or things that you just love to, to inject into the story. Do they necessarily make the story better, right? Um, and we could spend hours just talking about the killing of one's darlings, but she's quite capable of being a very strict editor. So that's, yeah, that's another reason why we work together well is because I, I've come to count on her to, you know, to use that yardstick. So speaking of the characters, outside of the two characters that you have in this story, what is your character's favorite or maybe is so evil that maybe it's not your favorite but you cannot keep them out of the book <laughs> well I know I thought sorry <laughs> um, actually I'm going to let you take a swing no, at this no no <laughs> okay. no, no. alright um, so um, yeah it's not like swinging for the fences but uh, you know it really is uh, so there is a particular character in one of the bookends that she's referring to um, and it is a character that uh, represents um, obstacles in the human spirit, obstacles in the psyche, um, and it's embodied in a particular character that um, I found both delicious to write and also frightening to write. Um, that any entity could be so evil and yet at the same time humorous enough to fool people. And so that is, the writing of that story is something that has, at times, awakened me in the dead of night. At other times, I've woken up with realizations, no, this needs to change, that could be more sharp. You know, it's, and so, and I do that anyway with all my characters. That particular character has yet to be revealed to the world, but it is one that um, will cause people to rethink their definition of evil. Okay? And I love how you said it. It's almost made me think of that movie, is it Halloween? Where <laughs> the writer is writing the story and there is a puppet that came to life and his old books came to life and he's like trying to... I haven't seen, I haven't that. seen that. Oh no, my no. gosh, y'all yeah, so Sounds just, delightful. I almost wish I'd written it. It is exquisite. It. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned Halloween. My wife... I. Um, she wasn't yet my wife when I took her to her first movie experience with me. <laughs> Turned out to be Halloween. Uh, and I'm sure that's part of the reason it took her so long to, uh, you know, say yes to marrying me. 
is because of Halloween. So that movie uh, still triggers a response somewhere up here. Yeah, honey. Yeah, it's okay. I, I, I know. All right. Yeah, so Jack Black was the writer that played oh, the role. I've heard of this story. It just yeah. came out as a movie, I think, last year ish. Okay. And oh, I love that movie. I just think. Can you think of the title? Halloween's on there. We'll think about it. Halloween is in the, we'll, in the time. We'll put the videos. All for right, very good. <laughs> yeah. So let's say you have a time machine available, and you came for five minutes to meet your younger self. What age would you go into, and what advice would you give yourself? Oh, wow. Um, I would say. Grit your teeth and get ready for the impact of life because some painful things are going to happen. But if you stick with it and if you learn to have faith in the people that love you the most, you will survive it and you'll come away richer in the, in the story of your own life. And so I wouldn't try to deny my younger self that experience, but I would caution them to uh, buckle up, okay? Buckle up and so, enjoy the ride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been blessed to have people who love me and also incredible experiences, some of which weren't painful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, I think, I think that being able to capture all those elements in a, in a way that's truthful with readers, that doesn't BS them, that doesn't you know, speak down to people, but challenges them uh, is one of the best things a writer can do for his readership, Exquisite. his or her readership. Exquisite. Let's have a little fun. Let's get to know you and get to know what you enjoy. Wow, if you don't you know were, me enough yet. <laughs> if you were to write a book about a superhero, or if you were a superhero, what qualities would you assign? What powers would your superhero have? And why? Well. <laughs> no pressure. You don't take it easy on him, do you? Um, I think I need one of those lamps that shines for you. Yes. <laughs> the light bulb. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to give you a glimpse into the first of the two book stops by what I'm about to tell you. Um, that superhero would be someone whose empathic capacity and abilities to heal uh, through reflection would be gifts that they share with others in a way that saves lives. Wow. Because I've met such a person. That's exquisite. Yeah, so that's... Um, that's who comes to mind for me as a superhero. And wow. it's not somebody you would look at on the street and think, wow, you'll never forget her. No, you, you, she's, she didn't have that kind of effect until you got to know her and come to realize her gifts and what she could do to help people. Wow. So I hope I haven't given away too much. I don't think so. And I think perfect. that's an incredible gift. I do that's too. That's an incredible gift. It's part of the reason I'm sitting here. Okay. Phenomenal. So, next? Next. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. You've lobbed enough softballs. Throw me something hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, this one is going to be fun. What is your favorite pizza? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> any, uh, no, I won't, I won't say that. You're like a plain dodgeball. <laughs> yeah, right. So, my favorite pizza, this is, this is the deep part of the conversation, folks. Uh, for me, is one that's just loaded up with all kinds of vegetables and maybe a, maybe a little bit of Italian sausage. What that's about ice cream? On pizza? <laughs> On pizza. <laughs> that's easy. Uh, chocolate mint chip is my most favorite. Exquisite. And what type of music do you like? I like all kinds of music. Uh, I enjoy everything from classical to um, to jazz, rock, um, bluegrass, a little bit, but I like all kinds of music. 
I'm not a big fan of uh, death metal or uh, rap, okay? Um, have you ever seen a rap keyboard, by the way? A, a, a keyboard or a piano, an upright piano that's, that's designed for rap? It's got three notes, it's got three keys, okay? And they're all bass keys. I think I'm a rapper. Yeah, I think you are. So, I can push through buttons, like, so, I can do this. Sorry, sorry guys. Full disclosure, I'm, I'm not really a big fan of either of those two. But, uh, I can talk that fast now. Maybe in Russian. No, there's there's a real there's a real talent to it. I'm not, you know, not demoting the talent. I'm just oh, saying yeah. it's not my it's not my cup of tea. It's like some people do not like classical music or I love classical opera, music. opera yeah, for yeah. instance. But I love mm -hmm. just like you. But uh, to me, I used to like certain genre, and you always kind of. In your parts of life, you right. morph from one place to another, in my opinion. And Indeed. I think, and that's how it happens. Mm -hmm. Because I used to like some rap, now I like some Russian rap. And it, it goes in and out, like yeah. rock. Yeah. I like certain parts of rock, and then listen mm -hmm. to some, like, woof. Right. I'm like, that was loud. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. No, but that's exquisite. And I, if we were switching roles, and you were asking yourselves a question. Is there a question that you think I did not ask, but your readers would like to know about you? Oh, wow. <clears throat> she just gets better at this, doesn't she? Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, I can hum the Jeopardy down. music. Yeah. I, I'm sure. I'm sure Walt can, can shorten we'll this. We'll play a bit. some Def Leppard. No. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, wow. You distracted him. What we would could I... start singing some Def Leppard real quick. No. Would you? Can I ask you to rephrase that question for me? <laughs> <laughs> Or try. If you, if you were a Russian podcast host. <laughs> okay. So I'm the you. Turkish Cafe and Lounge. I'm you, and you're me, and I really want to know something about, about you as the writer. About you. But you have to ask the question me? with a slight Russian accent, because that will make all the difference. You will feel more on the spot. Yeah, that's just going to flow from me. Uh, so... <laughs> It's like, what question do you think your readers or what would they like to know about you that I haven't asked about? Um, okay, I'm going to answer it this way. Damn I'm Russians. Gonna I'm, gonna <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you three things about myself, two of which are true. You tell me which one is not. Oh, he's throwing curveballs at me now. I, uh, okay, so I, look, first of all, I ran for office. I ran for congressional office in 1998, mm -hmm. okay? He did not get elected. Uh, oh, sorry. You had to spoil it. You had to sorry. spoil it. I wanted people to ask, okay, it, yeah. Well, dark, good for you. You didn't get elected. Dark, dark tail, right. <laughs> uh, second thing is, um, I spent a night in jail, and... Um, during that time, I was accosted by an inmate. Okay. Third thing, um, when I was a boy, I was struck by a uh, by a moving truck and thrown 50 feet in the air. I got up, dusted myself off, and walked away. You tell me which of those three is not true. It's probably hard to fly in the air and dust yourself off. I would say that one. When I was seven years old, I was struck by a moving pickup truck, thrown 50 feet in the air, into a culvert, got up, dusted myself off, and walked away. Wow. With priests and nuns genuflecting and praying, okay? Because it was happened across the street from a church. Now which one? Yeah, you're two to two still. Get up. Well, I'm guessing the jail story is not true then. So I never ran for Congress. I did spend a night in jail, and I was accosted the next morning by a very hungry inmate who wanted to know if he could have my breakfast. I said, yeah, here you go. <laughs> there we have it. So now both you know something about me that you didn't before, 
and I've tried to answer your question from hell. <laughs> because that's a really tough question. Well, I was following you from Prague. <laughs> well, I, have, I have a question that I wish you'd asked it. Yes. I throw one in. I can like really put you on the spot and completely embarrass you, but I'm not going to. <laughs> oh, she could. I know. Um, you have a lot of book ideas, works in progress, things percolating uh, in that in that great brain of yours. Which one are you the most excited about developing, and can you say anything about it? <laughs> well, there are several projects in the works. Um, Heather has mentioned two of them that are not yet published. Um, there is a project I'm about to begin, and it takes place in a swamp in Florida. Okay. Um, so that's the first, and I'm excited to write that for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is meeting some of the individuals involved in this suspenseful drama. Okay? Um, a, a near, it was a life and death situation. Okay? So that's, that's one. Uh, there's a longer term one that I... Um, want to get to eventually, and this is going to require still further research, but it requires me to return to Holland. My family and I lived in Holland for three years, Wow! and I need to, re so we have friends there, and we visit them periodically. There is uh, something that happened to us living in a house in Holland uh, from 1995 to 1998, and uh, it's a story that I have to write. Um, and it's going to require me, among other things, to interview a series of prostitutes in Amsterdam. So, I'm sure those ladies, they know a lot about the history of Amsterdam and Holland. And Indeed. So that's just a, a brief tease about a couple of stories. But the first one, wait. the one that's most in mind, uppermost in mind right now, is, is this... Um, it's a shorter story, but it's uh, intense, and it involves young people. So I have to give that the attention it deserves, and as well as the treatment, so to make that story readable and approachable by them. Okay. So it's a challenge, and I like challenges like that. Yeah, as uh, comical as a lot of people may address to women in the oldest profession, but. Will we also forget the story? Oh, yeah. Nobody wakes up, no little girl wakes up and says, you know what? I'm going to be in a light, red light district and I'm going to be this. There's a no, reason they why they're there. How did they get there? Absolutely. And usually, 99.9%, .9%, there is a tragedy involved in this series of um, unfortunate events. So let's just... And take off on that. Let that idea percolate. That's that's phenomenal. I can't wait to read that because I think it will touch lives of and many Danny, different people. Ben, <laughs> if you're watching this, okay, you are taking me there, okay? <laughs> ben already knows this, but I'm going to enlist his younger brother, Danny, as well. Yeah, you guys. I'm talking to you. All right? You're not getting away, Scott Free. I need your help, okay? Absolutely. So I can't wait. It looks like you've got a lot on your plate. I'll be more than happy to have you back on the podcast in a couple of uh, months or maybe a year yeah. and see where you are on your projects. That's that exquisite. Super. Thank, Thank you, you for taking your valuable time to be here. Thank you for asking us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And we were here on As Real As They Come Dallas with Paul. Ryan Elt. Yes. And Miss Heather. Heather McEnroe. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, comment. We'll be more than happy to know what's going on with you and what thoughts you have. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>